So our next speaker is Josh Mormon, who is filling in for someone who couldn't make it or we had to swap around. And he is going to talk to us about channel equalization using GNU Radio. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Josh Mormon. I am from the United States. I work for an applied research organization, Prospecta Labs. I'm also one of the project officers at GNU Radio. Um, and motivation for this work, found myself on a few projects where we needed equalizers. Um, GNU Radio has some existing equalizers. Um, you know, if you dig through, you'll find them in the block tree. Um, but they're, they're missing some features that I needed. Um, so needed to go in and um, add some functionality, namely need to equalize on training sequences. So these are all, these are all blind equalizers. Um, and expand the available adaptive algorithms um, and, and restructure a bit. So we'll talk through, I think I swapped this slide. So we're going to go through and, and talk through why do you need equalization, um, talk a, a little bit about the theory of equalization, um, and then different types of equalizers. What are the structures? Why are they different? Um, why would we need different structures? And then we'll get into the GNU Radio implementation of this. All right, so all the, all the code is, is posted up on GitHub here. Um, there's one dependency. Um, so if you run CMake, it'll find it doesn't work unless you have this. But uh, yeah, so, so grab this, and uh, if, if you're interested in running these examples locally. So why do we need equalization? So the, the, main, reason, the main reason that your signal gets messed up and you can you can recover it better with a good equalizer is because of the, the wireless channel. So if you think about, your, if you're trying to transmit a signal from point A to point B, you get multiple copies of that signal bouncing off things, all getting received. So if these are my data symbols I'm transmitting, I'm going to get a copy and then a time-shifted copy, another time-shifted copy. Much more complex. This is some notional example, right? Um, what that's going to lead to is inner symbol interference. So, you know, our, our nice co packed constellation here gets all smeared and um, mixed up with all the, all the adjacent symbols. And so we get this jumbled mess, right? So that's what we need an equalizer to get from here back to here, you know, even cleaner depending on our um, SNR of our receiver at that point. So all of this has some, some time domain um, dispersion, right? This is the time domain representation of some notional channel that we've set up. It also has a frequency domain representation. So if your signal is wideband enough, you're, um, you're going to get peaks and nulls at different frequencies. You're going to have frequency selective fading. And, um, you know, this is, this is all just normalized frequency. We don't see how this exactly relates to symbol rate and, um, symbol rate and bandwidth and all that. And then in the time domain, you know, we, if we transmitted these perfectly square um, uh, symbols, on the other side across the channel, you know, we're going to get all time dispersed things, which, you know, we would have some kind of symbol shaping to begin with here to help with ISI. So channel effects, main reason that we need an equalizer. Another reason is the hardware filters. Um, you know, even just slight roll off is going to cause smearing of one symbol into the next. So you look at just something with, you know, a couple of dB on the edge. Maybe um, you have some, some received filter. Maybe you have some, trans, uh, you have some amplifier. Maybe even some nonlinear things, amplifier distortion. Um, you know, it's going to cause smearing and spread out your constellation. So one, one concept we have to keep in mind here when we're talking about our need for an equalizer is coherence bandwidth. So if we have, so say this is the response of the channel over frequency, it's only, and we, we look at, these are, say these are two different channels. This top one would be a highly dispersive channel, a very long tail on the response of the, of the taps. Um, on the bottom would be a less dispersive channel. So this would have a wider coherence bandwidth. We can operate in a wider band without the need for an equalizer up top. We, we, can't, we can barely operate on a very narrow band signal without needing some equalization. So this is really the problem we're looking at in this, in this presentation is 
single carrier wideband signals and how are we going to equalize for those. We want, we want to be able to operate over this whole band and equalize for all this mess. All right. So the basic signal model we're going to be looking at is if we, we've transmitted a signal, our, our channel model is going to be the combination of our filter effects and our channel effects. There's going to be some additive white noise, um, additive Gaussian white noise at the receiver, and then this U of N is what we're going to receive. So just a simple convolutional channel model. We're going to assume linear time invariance at this point as well. Um, just so we want to be able to observe it over a period of time and then counteract the effects of the channel and not, not worry just yet about tracking it and time-varying aspects of the channel. So, in theory, what we should be able to do is we receive some signals that have been modified by the channel some, um, with some noise. We should be able to just inverse that channel. We're done. Not quite that easy. This is what we would call a zero-forcing equalizer. And the problem is that first we have to come up with an estimate of this channel, right? And once we come up with an estimate of this channel, it's a finite response estimate to really an infinite, um, an infinite uh, channel response. And then so we truncate it there, and then we have to invert it. So we're taking something finite, inverting it, and another estimation it's just not going to do a good approximation to minimize the error we're trying to minimize. Because um, this is also our problem, too. We have additive noise. So once we do this, we're not, we're not inverting the channel in a way that's going to minimize the noise as well. So zero-forcing filters, they don't work great in practice on, on single carrier signals. Um, so we need another criterion. And you can, you can, the optimal way to back out your, of your channel response is through a maximum likelihood sequ sequence estimation. You know, you do that by tracing what you receive through the trellis of possible states, and then, you know, you use the Viterbi algorithm to find that maximum likelihood sequence. That's very computationally intensive. You know, not for, um, you know, it's probably not something you would do in practice necessarily. Um, so what we want to do is we want to look at the minimum mean squared error criteria for um, this problem. So what we want to do is, if, if we say we want to create this filter W, so this, this filter W is basically what we, want to, um, what we want to come up as the inverse of our channel, right? We want to come up with a W such that it does the best job of recovering these symbols. So if W is the filter taps we're going after, then the error is the original symbols we sent minus that filter convolved with our received signal. So that's, that's the error we're trying to minim minimize. So if we set up a cost function here, what we want to do is we want to find the minimum of that cost function. And so dot, 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 we get down to the answer, um, which, is, which is the covariance of our signal um, the, the cross-correlation of our signal with our data symbols, that's P. And so the, the inverse of our, our covariance matrix um, multiplied by this, this is our optimum minimum SV filter. And that's obtained by finding the gradient of our cost function, figuring out where it's set to zero, and finding the minimum. So this is a, this is a static solution to the, to the MMSE equation. Um, we'll get into adaptive algorithms that are going to be able to track, track this as your channel moves. You know, as people move around in your environment, your, your transmitter, your receiver move around, you know, we need to track that and keep up with the optimal filter at any point in time. So, but right now we're just look at one point in time, we can find the best filter taps that are going to get rid of the channel effects. So the structure, so this is, this is the structure that exists in, in the GNU radio box currently, and this is the um, they're, it's, they're linear equalizers. So linear equalizer, it's going to be our received signal passed through some filter that gets updated in some way. So just an FIR filter, we come up with some estimate of the received signal after we've gone through this, this filter, and then we calculate error. The error and the received signal are somehow used to update this filter. 
So we'll talk about we'll talk about how this these adaptive algorithms more in a minute. But for right now, the general structure is just FIR filter. FIR filter, we're going to update the taps based on our calculated error. So there's one more variation that we haven't talked about, decision directed. So all the current equalizers in GNU Radio are decision directed. They don't know anything about the training sequence. Um, so they make some estimate. They say, OK, you know, I was, I was expecting a QPSK constellation. This, um, this symbol I just received was closest to this constellation point, so I'm going to assume that. So that's pretty good in high SNR environments. Um, when you get into lower SNR, that's not good. And your decision-directed equalizer is just adding tons of noise back into the error signal. And it just won't work. So another uh, varying structure of, of the equalizer is the decision feedback equalizer. So if you, if you notice, the first part of this looks just like the, the linear equalizer. We have a feed-forward FIR filter. We have an adaptive algorithm that's going to set these taps, but there's this feedback step. So what the, what the decision feedback equalizer assumes is that not all of the inner symbol interference is going to be canceled by this filter. Some is going to bleed into the um, past, past and future symbols. And so what we do here is we go ahead and make symbol decisions, um, you know, as you normally would in your receiver, but then use those symbol decisions as another filter that's going to feed into the, um, the output of this is going to feed back into your symbol slicer. So now what, what, it, what a feedback equalizer is able to do, if you have a highly nonlinear channel, this is a nonlinear structure. So that's, that's one situation where you need a, a, a DFE. Um, another is that linear equalizers, if you have very strong nulls in your frequency re response, the um, linear equalizer can uh, enhance those, those null, the noise in those spots and and so you get very, a very noisy equalized signal. So we'll see some examples of that later on. All right, so the current, the current GNU radio blocks, they work. They're, they're, um, th these were the basis of this development, was you know, the CMA block and this LMS block, structurally very similar. Um, they're each just an FIR with an adaptive algorithm to update the taps. Um, but you know, there, th this one, I just thought this was funny. And GNU Radio, there's actually a comment in the code that said, if this doesn't work, I don't know if it works. So um, it was obviously a part of the code that needed some love here. Um, so another, another issue with the existing GNU Radio blocks is that um, the adaptive algorithm is baked into the block itself. So one of the themes that, you know, that we talked about at the Hackfest that you probably hear Marcus talk about is modularity in GNU Radio. And one of the things that we want to um, do here is have a more modular um, equalizer structure. The adaptive algorithm is very separate from the actual equalizer structure. So we want to pull those apart. Um, you know, essentially, if you look at this, this block and this block, they're 90% the same code. So we want to we want to break out the parts that are the same, and break out the parts that are different. So what we have um, up on the GitHub is some new blocks. So there's two new blocks. There's this linear equalizer block, um, which we talked about. You know, which is, you know, it's the the basis for these blocks. It's just these blocks stripped out um, stripped out the adaptive algorithm part. And then there's now a decision feedback algorithm, uh, equalizer. And then, so now these blocks take in an adaptive algorithm object. So this is modeled on the digital constellation objects. So it's just, it holds a few methods, and then you can use it in either of these, um, either, either of the equalizer structures. And it also, this algorithm object also takes in a constellation object if you want to do decision-directed equalization. All right, so we just talked about this, um, the linear and decision feedback. It's just both a filter. Um, they're fractional spaced equalizers, which means it's going to take in um, 
an upsampled signal um, by some samples per signal, and then it's going to decimate the output down to your sample rate. Um, it's also, so each, um, each adaptive algorithm is going to initialize the weights some way, update the taps, and also provide some error estimation. <laughs> So now, now we get into adaptive equalization. Um, so how can we track this, uh, track our channel state as the channel is changing? <laughs> so there's a lot of different algorithms. This is a very small list of, of adaptive algorithms. So you know, one thing we could do, we talked about the MMSE direct solution. We can directly invert the matrix at every time we get this training sequence. Okay, um, that doesn't track very well. We have to just keep updating it. Um, LMS, it converges more slowly, but computationally it's very simple. It's just one dot product, essentially. Um, normalized LMS recursively squares. This adapts very quickly. Um, and we'll see the difference between RLS and LMS. And, um, but it's more computationally intensive. Not crazy, it's just doing some, a little bit of matrix math. And then CMA, constant modulus algorithm. It's a blind method, so rather than using um, a training sequence or decisions that we make, we're just using the property that the signal has a constant modulus, and we're going to get how far from the unit circle is our error. So rather than doing a whole derivation of these, we just get right down to the algorithm. Um, so LMS, what we do, we have some initial weights. We assume something. We have a starting point. We don't know you know, we, we have the, um, the cost function, the minimum error cost function that we're trying to find adaptively the minimum of. So we start at some weights. We're somewhere on this surface. And we're going to descend in a way that gets us to the bottom. And the way we do that, you know, we're going to push our weight estimate in the steepest direction toward the minimum of that cost function. Um, so the way we're going to do that is our next weights are going to be our previous weights plus some step size times the signal we received pushed away from the error we calculated. We're going to push in a way that's orthogonal to the error. And then in LMS, normalized LMS is just a very slight modification. We're just going to normalize that step size by the, um, by the <coughs> amplitude of the signal we received, by the magnitude of that signal. So CMA, mentioned briefly, it's the, it's the same weight update as LMS. We're going to you know, push in the way away from how we calculated our error. But what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our error differently. Assume we're receiving like a QPSK signal, 8PSK, any kind of constant modulus signal. Um, what, what we want to do is calculate the error how far from that circle we expect our symbols to be. So that's all CMA is. So we don't have to be phase aligned at this point. Um, we just have to be AGC'd. We have to, we have to um, you know, this has to be a known unit circle. And then RLS um, is a it's, it's a, it's a recursive solution uh, to the MMSE problem. You know, we're assuming that recursively all of the decisions we made in our TAP updates have built up. <laughs> And so there's a forgetting factor, um, which says how much, how much of the previous calculation am I going to include in the next step? Um, and then here's the math here. Um, it's, not, it's not terrible. It, there's just a few um, matrix multiplies, which makes it more computationally intensive than, than the LMS. But it converges very quickly. So, and then look at, looking forward with this stuff, um, now that we've separated the algorithms from the equalizer structure, we have, um, it's much easier to add more algorithms. You, know, you want to try out some, some equalizer structure, it's very little bit of code that has to be added, a little object. Um, you could even add neural network-based equalizers if you wanted to, that's a thing. And then OFDM we haven't even touched. OFDM, uh, and there's, there's folks that are, you know, much better experts on this than me, but if you look at, say, LTE, um, you have, in LTE, you have training symbols that are spaced across frequency and time. So that gives you a surface 
that you can back it. You can actually do a zero forcing equalizer in LTE. And there's other things you can do. Um, but it's, it's, it's a different problem than the single carrier um, example. So, so one, one note, I mentioned this briefly. Um, one of the key drivers of this is we wanted to handle bursty data. We wanted some equalizers. So you know, a, lot, a lot of the blocks in GNU Radio, including these equalizers, have all the functionality baked into the work function. Um, so just an implementation note, I really tried in this implementation to pull the signal processing into a function that could be called from outside of GNU Radio, that you could just use this as a signal processing library. Um, so looking forward, you know, in, in work I'm doing, I'm trying to do that more. Um, hopefully that's something we address in the future of GNU Radio. So let's look at some performance comparison. Um, I think I have these as videos. Let's see if they work. Nope. Oh, there we go. Uh, so th this particular example, we have, actually, you know what? Rather than doing this, I'm just going to pull up um, actual GNU Radio. So let's look up first RLS versus LMS. So they both get you to the same point. But if you look at the, the top, um, there's some rough measurement of EVM of the signal. You know, how far, how far are each of these um, clusters in magnitude uh, from the entire constellation magnitude? Um, so you, you, if you look, RLS converged down towards zero a little bit quicker than the LMS. It's all relative. Who knows you know, what the SNR is set to in here. Um, so you, you can see that, that the RLS converged more quickly. Um, let's take a look at, let's take a look at this one. So this, so you'll see this is a comparison of um, just an LMS. LMS converged, you know, very quickly when it was given a trading sequence. So that was one of the other drivers of this work, was wanted to be able to equalize when you actually see a training sequence. Um, and then, but the decision directed version, it took a while to converge. It went, it didn't know what to do, and finally it latched on to what it should be doing and converged down <laughs> towards zero. It was good in the end. The original GNU radio block um, never quite converged in this case under these scenarios. So there were some slight implementation differences. Um, I won't get into. Okay, and I think I'm starting to run out of time here. Um, just do a quick um, other resources. There is another out of tree module, uh, GR Adapt, um, that someone, I, I don't know this person. I don't know if uh, Carol is here. Um, but this, this was an excellent implementation of other applications of adaptive algorithms. So this is worth taking a look at. And then there are some actually very good YouTube videos, um, university lectures on MMSE, LMS, RLS, all the derivations. So highly recommend those. They do a much better than me, job than me, and then books and papers and things. All right, so questions, anybody? Yeah. One bureaucratic note, if we could do a little bit of defragging so we can get these people in and I can figure out the uh, room changeover in people and questions. Hey, yes? Uh, so the question for the training sequences, do you algorithms require very specific training sequences so it can be defined? Because, for example, if I want to design my own customized, customized protocol, mm -hmm. I must have one to have some training sequence of preamble pilot signal, right? So yes. can I use that also in the code? Yes, so, okay. Um, so so for, for this particular um, implementation, you can give it anything for the training sequence. You just give it a series of symbols. It's going to, um, can I pop up real quick? I'll just show you really quick what I was. Five minutes, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So, so what... This, this just threw in, th these are just based on the, um, the stock examples in GNU Radio in, in GR Digital. Um, and it, it just, it, there's a preamble plus data. Data is some random symbols. Preamble is just, I think, I think I made up some gold sequence here. Okay. But you can give it anything. I you know, it, it was, oh, 
Well, Mother 5 is a semester passing or something, so pretty You can't, yeah, as long as, I mean, the real thing here with your uh, training sequence is you have to, you have to be able to correlate against it. So, yeah, you yeah, see, yeah, there's, yeah. Yeah. so whatever the, you know, the autocorrelation properties of that sequence are is what's going to be a limiting factor. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. Maybe. Cool. Uh, yes. Uh, one quick uh, on that. So if you like it uh, training, but it, it's it's fine when, when you have a peer-to-peer -peer static. But what if some one side or the other or both they like uh, you know move through space? How how can then you know uh, you know train a thing? Yes. Uh, good good question. So the the question was if if your uh, transmitter receiver are moving, how yes. can how can it yes. train? Yes. So you're, if you're constantly sending new training sequences, um, you know the 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 time between those training sequences needs to be, you know, less than the coherence time of the channel, right? And your, your LMS, TAP updates, RLS, whatever algorithm you're, you're using, you know, needs to be able to update with the changes in your channel. You need to load, load, load. It constantly retrain. That, that's in, and so the LMS is going to track that and keep finding that minimum. Like how qu qu quickly is, is that? It all depends on the channel. Okay. Yeah. So, in, in, you know, indoor channel might be um, very long coherence time because things aren't moving around. If you're on a high-speed train, it'll be a very short coherence time. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sec. Uh, maybe a stupid question, but uh, how, how much does this benefit if you um, uh, oversample by uh, the far higher than the symbol rate? How much does um, Not a stupid question. Yeah, so the question is how, what's the benefit of oversampling um, at a much higher rate? Um, you know, I, I know that equalizers generally work better if you're oversampled by t at least two or four. Um, if you go more than that, I'm, I'm not sure. Because, you know, the equalizer, you know, it's, it's going to the, the taps. I didn't show one here that outputs the taps. Um, that, that's one, one of the outputs in the equalizer block here is, is the taps. Um, I thought I had one. Uh, this one, does this one output the taps? Well, you know what? Yeah. Limited by the signal bandwidth. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the taps that it finds, you know, it's going to come up with some time domain shape um, that just needs to be within, um, the, you know, the, the coherence bandwidth of what you're trying to do. Yes. So if you do some performance tests, like to what bandwidth, to what sample rate can you train up on such a machine? Is anyone going to leave? Oh. If you could go <laughs> ahead and leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't have those numbers, no. Um, it's the, there were a couple of things I was able to... Um, Compared to the original GNU radio blocks, there was a couple things I was able to volcify in here. Um, so that, that definitely improved the performance, but I don't have uh, quantitative numbers. All right. Thank you. Yes.